On the 28th of December 1965, a service was held in Westminster Abbey, London, to mark the 900th anniversary of its consecration in 1065. Her Majesty the Queen, Prince Philip and other members of the royal family were at the service, which was described to radio listeners in Britain by John Snagg. And today, indeed, Westminster Abbey is at its most magnificent. Well, all the fabric and the stonework inside here has been cleansed and the grime of modern London and the centuries have been swept away. The organ and the screens have all been newly regilded. And there in the sacrarium is the abbey plate with the pattern laid out. And upon the altar itself, the candlesticks and the cross of gold are glinting under the glare of the arc lights. But it's almost certain that some kind of religious house existed here at Westminster, uh, then called Thorny Island, more than 900 years ago. But certain it is that on the 28th of December, Holy Innocent's Day in 1065, the church of St. Peter was consecrated. And this church, which was built by Edward, Saint, King and Confessor. Uh, only a few days after that consecration, Edward died and the church became his burial place and his shrine. But this, as we're sitting in it today, is not the original fabric or design, though it did, the original one did stand for nearly 200 years, because it was Henry III who, in the year 1245, began the new building, this building, but on the same site and as a setting for a new shrine for the confessor. But a whole hundred years would have passed before the church as we see it today was completed. And there behind the high altar, is the St. Edward's Chapel, the shrine where lies the body of the confessor. And uh, surrounding that uh, chapel, there are the tombs of past kings, Edward I, Edward III, Richard II, and the Chantry Chapel of Henry V. And though today we pay tribute to its history and tradition, we also realize that the concern of Westminster Abbey today is really with the man in the present, in this challenging age, and. For this reason, on this its 900th year of foundation, it has taken the theme of one people. And so here in the Abbey, as we look down upon it, we can see that they've come from all parts of the world, ambassadors, high commissioners, statesmen and politicians. And today, they're led in tribute by the Queen. And those who are here, they come from all walks of life. They represent the professions, the trades, the craftsmen, the carpenters, stonemasons and plumbers, and from the entertainment world and the world of sport. It was Macaulay, who is buried here in this abbey, who said of it, that temple of science and reconciliation, where the enmities of 1,000 years lie buried. And it is in this year of one people that enmity is hoped to be buried and Westminster Abbey is playing its part. the arrival of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales and Princess Anne. Meantime, the Queen Mother, dressed in dark green fur coat and a green hat, and Princess Margaret alongside her, in a white coat trimmed with fur and a small fur hat. And now we arrive, look down towards the west door where we see the Queen has just arrived. She shakes hands with the chapter Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Anne, and the Prince of Wales. They're greeted by the Dean and the Chapter at the West Door. And the Queen wearing a fur hat with a brick red coat and carrying a red handbag. And now the procession is beginning to form up by the Great West Door. Everybody is standing, and the orchestra is waiting to play for the special music written by the master of the King Queen's music, uh, Sir Arthur Bliss. And now they're gathering by the west door, 
The Verger is taking up his position. The Dean's Verger is taking up his position. The flag of St. Edward's is being brought, which is the head of the procession. Then comes the Cross of Westminster, the Brotherhood of St. Peter, the Brotherhood of St. Edward, the Choristers, the Lay Vicars, the Minor Canons of Westminster Abbey, the Canons of Westminster, and then the Queen's Armsman, the Dean's Verger, and then the Dean of Westminster. The Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, followed by the senior chorister carrying the roses, and then the High Bailiff and High Steward of Westminster, Lord Clitheroe and Sir Henry Wilkins, the lay officers, the master of the Queen's scholars and the headmaster of Westminster, the Queen's scholars, the banner of the founder, St. Edward's King and Confessor, and then the banners of St. Oswald, St. Martin, St. Peter, and Our Lady, and finally the banner of St. George. And so the procession moves into the nave on its way up the nave under the organ screen to the chancel. Whilst this ceremonial prelude, written and conducted, will be conducted by Sir Arthur Bliss, the master of the Queen's music, during the procession.
Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales and Princess Anne are gone up the chancel steps past the altar into the chapel of St. Edward, where at the altar before the shrine of St. Edward's, the Dean will say a prayer and Her Majesty will pay her tribute. Sina Callister goes to the Queen, bows low to her. The Queen takes the roses from a golden cushion and steps forward to the altar and she lays them upon the altar, this small altar before the shrine of St. Edward's. She steps back and her place is taken by the Dean of Westminster. O God, who didst move thy servant, King Edward the Confessor, to build here an house to the honour of thy majesty, and didst enthrone him in the hearts of the English people, mercy grant to our Queen, that as she received her earthly crown, in this the place of his burial, so she, ever possessing the hearts of her people, may with him attain unto an heavenly crown, through him who is the only potentate and king of kings, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, whilst the congregation here stand, the Queen, who is out of sight, of course, she's in the chapel behind the high altar, the chapel of Edward Confessor, and she is the first to sign the Pilgrim's Book, inaugurating the 900th anniversary of Westminster Abbey. She signs the book. His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh follows. His Royal Highness dressed in morning coat. And then the Prince of Wales bends over the book and signs his name. And now Princess Anne. So, the first four signatures in the Pilgrim's Book at Westminster Abbey for the 900th anniversary, inaugurating one people, are the Queen, Duke of Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales, and Princess Anne. And now, the Dean leads the way to the door, leading through from St. Edward's Chapel to the chancel to the altar. Dean and the canons pass through the doorway to the altar, where at the altar is waiting the flag of St. Edward. The blue, dark blue flag trimmed with gold, and on it six golden martlets. Now the Queen comes back into the chancel, Queen of the Duke of Edinburgh. And with the High Bailiff and High Steward just in front of them, they are conducted to their positions at the Dean's stall in the choir just underneath the organ screen. And behind the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Prince of Wales, and Princess Anne. Prince of Wales still wearing his overcoat as he came in. Princess Anne wearing a dark black small hat with a purple coat trimmed with black fur. And now as they reach the foot of the steps through the choir, the Dean takes the flag of St. Edward and this is laid upon the altar with a flag so it is draped as part of the altar cloth. The central golden cross and the six martlets on a blue background trimmed in gold. And now as the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh arrive at their stalls, they are conducted to their stalls. First of all, Princess Anne, Prince of Wales, the Duke of Edinburgh, and lastly, the Queen takes her place. And so the orchestra, conducted by Douglas Guest, will play the national anthem.
we who have been granted by Almighty God the privilege of belonging to the Collegiate Church of St. Peter in Westminster, ask you to rejoice with us on this 900th anniversary of the founding of this church by Edward, called the Confessor, King and Saint, and to join with us now in worship and adoration of God the Father, who has been our refuge from one generation to another, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts and bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honour dwelleth.
For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, <clears throat> and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a coat the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the coat, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise.
the anthem finishes. The senior canon archdeacon of Westminster goes to the pulpit for the bidding prayer. Ye shall pray for Christ's holy Catholic Church, that is, for the whole congregation of Christian people dispersed throughout the whole world, and therein for the Queen's most excellent majesty, our sovereign Lady Elizabeth, by the grace of God of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the seas, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, Visitor of this Collegiate Church, over all persons and in all causes within her dominions, Supreme. For Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Pray also for the ministers and dispensers of God's holy word and sacraments, that their work may be blessed and the kingdom of God advanced by their labors. For the lords of Her Majesty's most honorable privy council, for the High Court of Parliament, for the right worship for the mayor, aldermen, and councillors of the city of Westminster, for the brotherhood of the most honorable order of the Bath, and for the whole commons of the realm, that all may live in the true faith and fear of God, in dutiful allegiance to the Queen, and in brotherly love, one toward another, and that there may never be wanting a worthy ministry to serve Almighty God in this land, ye shall implore his blessing on all places of godly worship and collegiate life, particularly on the royal peculiars, and in this church of St. Peter in Westminster, upon the reverend, the dean and chapter and their clerk, on the right honorable high steward and high bailiff, on the minor canons, the organist and master of the choristers, and the whole choral foundation, on the vergers, on the surveyor, and all who work upon the fabric, on the headmaster and scholars of Westminster School, and on all other members of the college, that here, and in every place specially set apart for God's honor and service, true religion and sound learning may forever flourish and abound. To these your prayers ye shall add unfeigned praises for mercies already received, for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. And on this day, in particular, let us thank God for the work of Edward the Confessor, founder, king, and saint, who amidst the turmoil of his times built here a palace and a monastery contiguous to one another, and thereby brought the seat of government of this commonwealth to Westminster, which, by its name and fame, still witnesses to the union of church and state as it is at this day. Next, in honor to St. Edward, let us give thanks for the work of King Henry III, who set about and largely accomplished the rebuilding of the church after a noble design in marble and fair stone, and translated the body of St. Edward to the shrine he had made for it on a mound of earth constructed for the burial of kings and queens. For King Henry VII, who built the Lady Chapel, which is also the chapel of the most honorable order of the Bath. For Queen Mary I, who rebuilt the shrine where the body on, 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 
where the body of the confessor still rests after it had been dismantled at the dissolution for Queen Elizabeth I. The shrine he had made for it on a mound of earth constructed for the burial of kings and queens. For King Henry VII, who built the Lady Chapel, which is also the chapel of the most honorable order of the Bath. For Queen Mary I, who rebuilt the shrine where the body of the confessor still rests after it had been dismantled at the dissolution. For Queen Elizabeth I, the royal foundress of the collegiate church, for the dean and prebendaries and 40 scholars still residing in its precincts, to whom she assigned many no noble privileges which they still enjoy. Nor must we forget our brethren of the Order of St. Benedict and the labors of abbots, monks, and craftsmen into whose inheritance of prayer and learning and community we have entered, striving like them to prefer nothing before the work of God, which is the unceasing prayer and praise of his most holy name. More particularly, we give thanks for the liberality of those many by whom this church has been maintained and endowed through the centuries, and in these latter days, for that great multitude who by their gifts in the year of the coronation of our Queen made possible the restoration of the Abbey to its present glory. Finally, let us praise God as is meet for all those who are departed out of this life in the faith of Christ, not least those who have been buried or remembered here, monarchs, statesmen, warriors, divines, poets, musicians, architects, scientists, and many others, known to us and unknown, and pray that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good example, that this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection in the life everlasting through our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, in whose words we sum up all our petitions saying as he has taught him, 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 as he has taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, poets, musicians, architects, scientists, and many others, known to us and unknown, and pray that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good example, that this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection in the life everlasting through our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, in whose words we sum up all our petitions, saying as he has taught us, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power and glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now, let us look to the future. We do so believing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. For us, the immediate future is this 900th anniversary year of the Abbey. We have chosen for the theme of the year one people. Why this theme? First, because through no merit of ours, the peoples of the world flock to this church. It has become, during the centuries, one of the famous churches of Christendom. In the English-speaking world, the Abbey is a household word. All come to this church of every race and color and creed and of no creed. All do not come as worshipers, but very few who come fail to look up at these soaring arches of Henry III's choir and transepts and Richard II's nave and at the late medieval splendor of Henry VII's chapel and looking up they wonder. Thus, because the whole world comes to this church, though for a multitude of different reasons, we would say to them all, we would say to you all, Sirs, ye are brethren. God has made of one blood all nations of men. Secondly, we have one people as our theme of the year because our world has become a neighborhood. This fact has by no means prevented the, the neighbors from quarreling. And from time to time, the human tragedy seems on the brink of explosion with the division of race and color now added to the already dangerous division of competing ideologies. Nevertheless, we have witnessed in these last years the rapid growth of a universal human consciousness. Mankind is aware of itself as a single organism. All human strife is now known to be fratricidal strife. To this rapidly growing universal human consciousness, we would speak from this focal point of the gathering of so many people together and say, Sirs, ye are brethren. God has made of one blood all nations of men. Thirdly, we have one people for our theme of the year because we are witnessing the growth of a universal human conscience. Slowly and painfully this grows. Nevertheless, with whatever struggles and setbacks, this universal conscience grows, and unless, which God forfend, the cataclysm comes and the dark ages return, the claims of justice for every man and of the inalienable dignity of every man will not be denied. The universal conscience of mankind 
will not allow these things to be denied. Fourthly, we have one people for the theme of the year because our day has seen a wonderful and God-given growth in the universal Christian consciousness, the ecumenical consciousness, the Catholic consciousness. Christ our Lord has never been divided. Christ never will be divided. But Christians have been divided sacramentally, theologically, they have anathematized one another. They have excommunicated one another. They have killed one another. The Holy Spirit of God, using the often untoward circumstances of our tumultuous human life, is pressing the Christians inexorably together and himself is saying, as the Spirit has always said, Sirs, ye are brethren, very members incorporate in the mystical body of God's Son, and God's Son is not divided. To the east of where I stand, Queen Elizabeth I is buried. But in the same tomb where she lies is Queen Mary Tudor. The inscription on the tomb runs, Consorts in the kingdom and in the tomb, here we rest, Elizabeth and Mary, in the hope of the resurrection. Could anything be plainer? In this place, let the enmities and animosities of 900 years lie buried, and here let there be a resurrection of the divided Christians into the one body of the undivided Lord. Then, as the Archbishop of Canterbury has said, it will not be the triumph of one church over other churches, but it will be the triumph of the one gospel over us all. Most reverend and right reverend fathers in God of our Anglican communion, most reverend and right reverend fathers of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Holy Orthodox Churches, Right Reverend and Reverend Brethren of the Church of Scotland, of the Methodist, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, and the Congregational Churches, General of the Salvation Army, so recently our guest for the great centenary celebration of William Booth, brother of the Society of Friends, the collegiate body of the Church of St. Peter in Westminster, through me, salute you with a holy kiss. What the Abbey can do, it will do, to set forward under God the cause of Christian unity, unity in the truth. Now, in this coming year, we would be truly Anglican, for there is still a distinctive Anglican vocation within Christendom, and our distinctively Anglican task is not yet done. But also we would be truly Catholic, opening our doors to all, and in our doctrine and discipline, cleaving steadfastly to what has been believed always, everywhere, and by all in the Church of the Undivided Lord. And we would be truly ecumenical, 
articulating as best we can the universal consciousness and conscience of mankind and the Catholic consciousness of all Christians. Our English mystic Julian of Norwich saw all this when she said, in the sight of God, all men are one man, and one man is all men. And that one man is Jesus Christ, the perfect image of God in our humanity, the center of the world's life, no less than he is the center of the life of his body, the church. And we are to be built up into one people in him until our corporate humanity comes to a full-grown man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But was not Christ crucified? He was. His great act of reconciliation was not made without the shedding of his blood. We proclaim the universal consciousness of mankind, but this unity is no simple achievement. We proclaim the Catholic consciousness of all Christians, pointing to that day of the Lord when all who are Christ's by baptism and faith shall have become what they are already in God's intention, one single body of the undivided Lord. But this unity also is no simple achievement. Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross and in no other way our one people theme will be hopelessly unrealistic unless the cross is at its heart. The cross must be at the heart of our work of human reconciliation. The cross must be at the heart of our Christian ecumenism if the human and the Christian unity are ever to be at that deep level of truth which alone is worthwhile. Our theme is one people in world and church, but the great circles of the world's life and the church's life must be spanned by the length and breadth and depth and height of the cross. There will be no peace and unity without it. Finally, let me honor those who have given their name to this day. I mean the holy innocents, those earliest victims of the crisis which was precipitated by the coming of Jesus Christ into this world, the little children who died not knowing why, not knowing for whom. The cross is never far away from Christmas Day. You and I can never be innocents. Our innocence is lost. But we might be saints, which again would only be at the price of the cross. And sanctity, holiness, if God gave it to our eager asking, would be the best and shortest route to our unity with one another, both in world and church. Edward the Confessor was for centuries a focal point of unity to Englishmen, not because he was a great king, but because he was a saint.
Now to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, be ascribed as is most just to do all honor, might, dominion, and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray for peace and unity in church and commonwealth. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on thy whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of thy perpetual providence, carry out the work of man's salvation that things which were cast down may be raised up, and that all things may return into unity through him by whom all things were made, even thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all mankind that we may be built up into one people. O God and Father of all, whom the whole heavens adore, let the whole earth also worship thee. All kingdoms obey thee. All tongues confess and bless thee. 
and the sons of men love thee and serve thee in peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us remember the innocents whose death for the infant Jesus' sake has made this a holy day. Almighty God, who out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast ordained strength and madest infants to glorify thee by their death, mortify and kill all vices in us, and so strengthen us by thy grace, that by the innocency of our lives and constancy of our faith even unto death, we may glorify thy holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us renew our Christmas joy in the birth of the divine child in our midst and contemplating him, adore him. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Almighty God, who hast given us thy only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen.
let us pray. O everlasting God, with whom a thousand years are but as one day, and in whose name are treasured here the memorials of many generations of men, grant to those who labor in this place such measures of thy grace and wisdom that they may neglect no portion of their manifold inheritance, but so guard and use it to thy glory and the enlargement of thy church, that the consecration of all human powers may set forward thy purpose of gathering up into one all things in Christ, through whom to thee be glory, now and evermore. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always.
And so, with the singing of the tedium, the setting by Benjamin Britten, the service comes to an end. The service to inaugurate the 900th anniversary year of Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey called the parish church of the English-speaking people, belonging to no diocese, it belongs to all. And now, as the processions leave the Abbey, led by the Ivory Cross, the representatives of the churches of the world, the choir, and behind the choir, the cross of Westminster, the golden cross of Westminster, the sacrist, and the canons, and the dean. And as the dean passes by the screen, he pauses for a moment, bows to Her Majesty. Her Majesty, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince of Wales, Princess Anne, the Queen Mother, and members of the royal family are then conducted to the West Door by the Dean of Westminster. And as they leave Westminster Abbey, to the street outside, to the music of William Walton's Crown Imperial March, and the bells of Westminster Abbey high above. The scene at the 900th anniversary service held in Westminster Abbey on the 28th of December 1965 was described by John Snell.